So in this video, we're going to take a DNA web website, the Angel 6 site we've been making, uh, and basically publish this and, and get it live. Uh, so in order to do that, uh, I haven't bothered doing videos on finishing up the other pages of the website, uh, simply because it's the same process of what I've shown on like the home page and the other pages. There's nothing new you're going to learn there. Uh, but the source code's available, you know, if you need to. Uh, so this is just the uh, DNA uh, Fabric 1 template. So if you were to start a new folder uh, and type in uh, DNA Web and then new template um, fabric.modern1 as normal, it'll create this, this effective website. So we've done this in all the other videos, nothing special here. So we're going to go into the source folder and just type DNA Web to start the uh, DNA Web engine up. I'll chuck that here so you can see. Uh, and then this will spin up the current website. So you can see this is the, I reload. This is the website we we're working on, which is my new website. Uh, you got all the animation stuff, the scroll stuff. Uh, you got the YouTube page, SolidWorks, got everything done now, every page is kind of done. So I'll leave you to browse over that um, once this goes live. So that's the website. Um, and then it will also open up the uh, VS Code folder. So the difference now from taking it from a, a standard website, if you will, a, a flat web root output with HTML, we now want to turn this into an ASP.NET core website. Uh, so there's a few steps to that. Um, so the first thing is we have in the uh, source DNA config, we output, uh, we have a static folder, sorry, for assets that gets copied to web root assets. Uh, this will change and we will copy to two places. Uh, so I'll do that in a minute. Uh, but the, the key here is in order to copy to two places, we also have to update the SAS config file I made in the SAS folder that outputs directly to web root assets. And instead, if we just go up a folder from SAS, then go into the assets folder, this is the one that's getting cloned via this assets here. So simply changing this from going up twice and directly into web root, if we just change it to go into the assets folder directly, uh, that will have the same effect as now it will copy the same stuff over. Um, so we, we still get the CSS, but the difference is now, um, instead of it going directly into web root assets and CSS, uh, it goes into the source assets CSS and then because this is a monitored static folder, this entire folder gets copied then to the web root assets folder. So that's how that's working. Um, that's that little step done. Every time you change the DNA config, it, it redoes the whole website because that's a, a fairly big change. That's kind of why that's happening. Uh, so the next phase is to, uh, oh, let's just add a, a title um, and the fav icon I've just noticed are missing. Let me just quickly chuck those into the design. Um, so I've already got a, an icon. If you want to put a fav icon on your website, which is the icon that appears at the top here on a website, just make an ICO file with ICO FX, uh, nice and easy to use, plenty of you know tutorials on how to do that. And then you make an icon, I've called my fav icon dot ICO. Uh, and in your uh, header below title or wherever, as long as it's in the head, you then provide uh, a link, uh, just like you do with CSS. And this time the, the RAL is shortcut space icon and the type is image forward slash X dash icon. So this is just pointing to that icon file. We save that when we refresh now, you can see we get the fab icon. Uh, let's change this title into a variable. So let's just do website title and then copy that into, well, we don't need to copy that actually, we just type it again. Uh, copy and paste one of the variables, call this website title, and let's call this angel6, free your mind. Save the variable, save the header, website reloads, we have the title now. So we've got the title. Uh, I, I don't bother with, you know, page headers on my website. It's just a small portfolio style website. So I've just got the same title, which is fine. Um, so the first thing that we really need to do is to actually make an ASP.NET Core website. So I want mine in web root to the static web, and I'm gonna make one called server root, which is the ASP.NET server. Uh, this is just my convention. You can use whatever you like. Uh, in here, I'm just gonna type CMD to open up a new 
uh, command window. And I'm just going to make a new .NET Core ASP website. You can use Visual Studio for this if you want. I just tend to do this quickly because it's an easy way to get started. So just .NET New MVC and enter. Uh, and that'll make a new MVC website and give you all the stuff. Um, then I'm going to clean up. We're going to generate these controllers in DNA Web. So delete controllers, delete models, object is temporary. All of the web route is going to come from our, again, DNA Web. So that goes as well. Um, the home page, all of these pages will generate. So we'll, we won't need that or that. We will generate a shared layout um, and a view imports and a view start and then specific pages for every page. So this entire folder can get generated, so that can go. App settings can go, bundle can go. And um, we're basically left with these things here. Uh, so if we then uh, rename this to uh, whatever you want, server it's fine for now, but you can rename your project as well if you like. And just open this up. This should find those three files uh, in the folder. And then it should work as a website. We'll have no pages right now, but it should compile, which is the important part. Uh, so we have properties launch settings get created when we open up the project. And now you can see it's made a properties folder, which is fine. But in the properties, we don't want IIS, so we'll delete the IIS. We'll then delete the inner profile of IIS. And we'll rename this thing to Kestrel because that's the underlying technology that's being used. Uh, and then this changes to Kestrel to launch. Uh, so that's the website up and running. Uh, I'm going to here, control RG to remove unused namespaces. Uh, I get rid of the home error page for my small site. There's, you know, just let it crash. If there's an error, there shouldn't be any. Program, same again. Control RG, remove unused namespaces, save and close. Uh, app settings, fine. So that's it. That's nice. Nice clean website now. Control Shift B should build. So we have a buildable blank website. So now what we need to do is re inject the um, the pages uh, into, well, we need to do two things. One is we need to make a controller, uh, and then two is we need to make the actual uh, pages to be seen. So we want them to output into this server root um, location. For all the pages to work as well, we need to see all of the assets. So we'll go to the DNA config, the top level one, put a comma at the end of here, copy paste and we'll also then output this to server root which is our uh, obviously the server we just made and www root is the folder that's used for asp.net core and then into assets and if we save that now uh, we get the whole thing rebuilding and we have a www root now with assets and then you've got your content inside what i have noticed though as you can see some things aren't loading there's only so many images and partial it's a bug I've just added to DNA Web um, that if a folder doesn't exist, like the destination folder assets doesn't exist, then it seems to miss files. Uh, so all you need to do in DNA Web, uh, if something's missing, just type generate and get it regenerate. And then this time you'll see now uh, the all the fonts are there now, all the images are there, everything's there. So that's just a little bug. It might be fixed by the time you know you're watching this video. But if you find that there's missing assets. Uh, just generate a second time and once the structure's there it's fine um, so that gives us the root file back now we need the controllers folder as we mentioned so inside the modern html modern one or whatever your you know whatever your files are i'm going to make a new folder call it server and in here you're going to learn something new because we're now going to make a new file called homecontroller.dnacs so not dhtml dnacs uh, and we can also generate C-sharp code in DNA Web. Uh, so this is for the purpose of being able to make servers. Uh, if you go to File, Preferences, Settings, and just add file associations like this, so you get the IntelliSense for C-sharp and HTML, uh, then that will give you uh, C-sharp here. Um, so in order to now make this file, it's as simple as it's already created, so I'm presuming we'll actually already have an output in uh, where would it have been unless it's not made anything yet uh, did it make anything save so it made in server home controller source so yes it went straight to uh, source HTML modern one server 
Oh no, where did it output? What was I missing? Uh, web roots, home controller, that's it. That's where it should be. So it's gone like where all the other files go. It's gone output to web root. And we've now got this CS file. It's got nothing in. That's not where we want it though. We, we don't want it in web root because it's got, this is a static site, not a, uh, a server. So there's a trick to do uh, output only to certain locations. Um, so the first thing we want to do is set an output um, element and we'll go up from, and this location is relative to the DNA configs output. So by default, we're saying the output path is web root. So when you're specifying a path here for the output, uh, not for includes, but for outputs, this is already presuming it's going to output to the web root folder, like it's based on the relative output path. So if we were in web root, uh, which is here, we've got to go up one folder into server root, as you can see there. Then we want a folder called controllers and then home controller. So now if we save that, we should find we now get controllers and a home controller. So we now have the home controller back. So it's as simple now as making a standard uh, controller like you would in Visual Studio. Uh, and you could copy and paste this from the blank ASP.NET MVC template we made, but I know this off by heart anyway. So it's just, you need to include the ASP.NET core.mvc uh, namespace. Uh, we'll give it a namespace just called uh, server root, doesn't really matter. Um, and then we'll have a root on the whole controller of top level and then action. So what this means is uh, this class um, here, I should write the class first, home controller, controller. Uh, this class now, because this is in the controllers folder and it's inherent from a controller. If you type website name forward slash, um, then something, whatever the thing after the forward slash is, uh, becomes the action. And the action is basically the methods inside of this property. So I action result um, index, for example, the index uh, homepage. You could do this and then return view. And now by default, if you typed forward slash home, or forward slash rather index, it would then find index. Uh, so this is a special case one uh, where we don't want index specifically. We want to make another route just for this one that is purely top level. So this means if you, this is basically acting like the default page when you just go to the website name itself, it'll it'll come into here. We can shorten this into uh, this style. So it's, um, it's still a function. It, yeah, still a method, uh, but it just looks slightly different because of the shorthand way of doing it, but it keeps it clean and short. Uh, and then we just copy and paste that and rename to say about. Now what will happen if we type forward slash and then about as the name, it will then look for an action because we've told it it's the action variable called about. So it's gonna find this view and then it's gonna return. Um, and I showed this in the other MVC videos. The way that will then work is it will look inside of here and then it will look for a views folder that doesn't exist yet. And then it will look inside a home folder because the name of the controller is home. And then it'll look for something called about. So if we just quickly chuck in all the other pages into here. Uh, so we have the about, we have the blog, uh, we have the contact. And I'm just looking at these here. About, blog, contact, index we've got. Uh, SolidWorks. And then YouTube. Uh, I think that's it, so that's the three. If we were to save that file now, uh, we have a controllers, a home, and it's all in there, it's generated for us. Um, what's left in that, that's the home controller done. Uh, yeah, there's nothing else in there that I can think of. So now, if we went to the actual um, project here, you can see it's automatically found, and it's now got a home controller in it, and now I'm trying to find that view. So we want to generate for every page we have. Uh, so we've got the about page. Uh, right now we have a default output when you don't specify one. It'll then go to the output folder with the same name. That's how DNA web works. So it's going to go to web root about .html. That's the automatic naming convention. Uh, so instead of we want to output to uh, two locations, which is what we want to do now, uh, we have to specify the output. So the first output will make basically the same as that make changes nothing now. That's kind of restating this is what happens by default. So it's going to output to web root because it's relative. 
uh, and it's going to have the name about and it's going to add the extension .html because there isn't an extension. So that is naturally just nothing's changed sort of thing, but now we've defined an output. So what we can now do is copy and paste and make another output. Uh, and this time, remember we're on web root, so we'll go up a folder into server root, make a folder called views, then home, and then about.cshtml. Um, and the difference here now is uh, we can have, uh, if we put um, a colon and then a name, can be anything, so we'll say server, this now is a, a profile. So this output uh, is now linked into a profile. So what we can do, because CSHTML files, if we delete that first and show you and save, uh, we'll now have a views home and we've got the about. But the issue with this about page in the ASP.NET page is it works by using that layout. So in views, we should have a shared folder and a layout. Uh, and that contains the header, the footer, and then this should just contain the content. So because we've got the header already included in here and the footer at the very bottom, we need to remove them, but only from the server generated files. So to do that, we basically tell this it's a profile called server. And then there's a little trick in DNA web for the header that we only want to include it in, in outputs that don't have a profile. So anything that simply doesn't have a colon and a name. If you put a colon and exclamation like a not in programming, it's basically saying only include the header if it doesn't have a, an exclamation mark and something after it. So if we do that for the header and the footer, and this is all explained on dnaweb.io, by the way, this is just DNA web stuff. Um, now, if we go to the views and the about, uh, we'll see we have no header or footer. We've just got the content, which is what we want. So now we've managed to keep the exact same page. So we've only written the HTML once. I mean, just by setting up the, um, the setup like this, which we can now copy and paste to everyone. So if we just go to blog, and paste, rename this to blog, uh, rename that one to blog, go to the bottom and make sure the foot is also excluded. And we do this for every one. We'll then have uh, the server generated files as well from the same, you know, the exact same uh, HTML files, which is what we want. So we're not having to keep two extra copies and try and maintain two different versions of code. This is all you know, the point of DNA web, you only have to do it once and you can make use of the exact same code for multiple situations, one for a static website and then one for the actual real website, if you will, the, the server. Uh, so we'll do it to the index and SolidWorks and then YouTube. last one and then all we've really done here the whole thing we've done up to this point is, is like I say we've, we've just generated the uh, the blank server like a really easy server ASP.NET Core server we've deleted basically this would go 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 this would go, go all that would be deleted this is all generated stuff this is when you compile uh, the actual site if you will um, this is now generated by the DNA web. This is copied over from static folder and this is generated. So all this is now a generated website um, from our DNA web code. So we, we've got two uh, two instances. So now if we run this, it's now found the views, it's found the web route, it's found everything we need. So this is running a, a real web server, if you will now, the actual um, ASP.NET Core website. Um, that has not found what we want. So let's take a look at here. Um, assets, images, logo flat. Let's double check we have what we want. Uh, WW root assets, images. Oh, so it's done a partial copy again, as I mentioned. Um, so we just do a generate and I'll fix that bug. It is quite annoying. It's something to do with when the folders don't exist. Um, I don't think refresh will make it work, or maybe it has. Run generate again. I basically added the, the kind of static folders uh, quickly to um, get this feature in. Right, so that seems to work. So, oh, I know what the other issue is now. We don't have complete, uh, we haven't done the layout. So we haven't got the header or footer in yet. So that's the other side we need to do. 
well this is up and running it's found the page if we went to like forward slash solidworks say it'll find the solidworks page and oh, i'll click the home page by mistake we go to solidworks you can see it's got the solidworks page here we're just missing the header and footer stuff so uh if we now add those and again like i say if you make a default uh asp.net core website you see the you have those in the view but like i say i know them off the top of my head so i'm just going to make them uh myself anyway so uh let's get this now in here we made so we made a home controller so the other thing we need to do uh is make a layout.dhtml it's kind of important uh, and we'll also have then an output for this and this is a server only output so we only need one uh, and this will go to server root views shared layout dot cshtml and we'll just tag it with server as well so it's in the server profile um, then we will want to include the what will we need the header and the footer and then render body so we'll basically be doing what this index would have well what all the pages typically do uh, which we excluded the header um, do I need to include the top menu actually uh, include header footer what is the top menu oh yeah there top menu yeah so we should have to include header top menu footer I believe no these include top menu there's actually a mistake here we include top menu twice just noticed that. Um, we have in the header, I'm gonna let me get this right. The header, we include the top menu. Or oh, am I just getting myself confused here? The top menu's there. No, that's right, we've got to include the header, then the top menu, and then the contents. Oh, I know why we don't need to do that, because we already include the top menu, we haven't excluded the top menu. We've only excluded the header and the footer. So what we'll need to do is take the header, the variables in the header, and paste them into layout. So we want to include variables, but because this is inside a folder, it's inside a server folder, and the variables is above, we need to step up a folder. Same for the header. This time we don't exclude it. Uh, and then we'll put the ASP.NET Core specific code in, which is, this is a razor condition, it's called the render body. Uh, and then include the footer. And all we're doing here, we save that, presuming that works, and we get an output. We'll have views, shared, layout. All that's done is generated uh, a layout file, which has got, close them off a minute. Uh, it's got the header, our header, then it's got the render body in there, and then it's got the footer. So that's, again, that's just ASP.NET uh, MVC, that's how it works. Uh, if we were to create a new folder called test, say, and we just went DNA web, uh, sorry, not DNA web, CMD, and as we did at the start, you just went .NET new MVC. Then you'll see that uh, it generates the views folder and it generates a shared and in the layout it generates oh that's gone a bit weird in the layout it generates its header with all its stuff in it then does the render body which is where your pages then your specific view pages these things get injected into here uh, and then there's the footer so that's basically all we've done. We've used our header. We've dumped our header in uh, via, you know, this. So we inject our header, then just put the render body, then our footer. Uh, and then we need the variables because the header makes use of variables. So if we were to exclude that, then it can't find things like website title. Uh, in fact, that's the only variable we use there. But uh, that's all we've done. And then we've told it to output to where we need it to. So that's the layout done. Uh, with the layout, we have then uh, the view import some view start i believe a left so again if we looked at the default output you got these two files and if you open them up 
the default is telling it which layout page to use. So we want to use the layout page we just made. So we need to copy that, if you will, uh, then make a new file uh, called view imports, paste that in, go over to the, oh, I haven't named that correctly, dhtml, uh, go over to the layout, copy this, and, oh, sorry, I think that's is that the right way around. Was that view start? So that's view start, not view imports. So that's view start. Uh, then this will be called shared. Uh, it's not in the shared folder, it's in the top folder. And it's also, yeah, underscore view start. So that's that page created. Uh, select all that, make the other one, which is view imports.dhtml. And that will be view imports. And then we'll just take the standard view imports. We're not using anything, so we'll just at least put the tag helper in there. So all we'll have in ours is the blank bit. Save that. And now we can delete that test one that we're done with. Uh, we'll go into here. And now we have the two pages. Let's double check them. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. So if we go back to Visual Studio. You can see now we've auto-generated all of the folders that we originally deleted. We now have the layout that's got our header and footer in. We've got the imports, we've got the layout, and we've got each page with the specific content. So we've effectively taken a static website and um, moved or rather generated the specific pieces of ASP.NET Core razor pages and controllers that we need for the website uh, in order to make it functional. So now if we press F5, uh, we should get uh, a effectively the same website, but now running in an actual ASP.NET Core website. So we've got the tile, we've got the icon, uh, we've got everything here, looks like it's loading. Uh, got the blog, yeah, got SolidWorks, YouTube, it all seems to be working. Uh, so that's the, that's the server now ready for publishing. Uh, there's one other thing that I'd do, uh, and that is for my website to have some downloads in the SolidWorks page that point to specific files. So if I show you those, if I go to the SolidWorks page, I have like download batch process, which is pointing to an URL, uh, and that's in variables. So we have variables download here. Now the thing is we don't want to have to, this variable exists in DNA web. We don't want to have to copy and paste this URL into our ASP.NET Core website uh, to match, you know, the expected URL. So we're going to generate another controller, and we'll just call it download controller DNACS. In here, we'll do the same as this for the most part. Copy and paste that. Paste in. Uh, we'll call this download controller. Then we have. We need to include the variables because we want to use them. So we just went to like this one, say, nix that part, paste that in. And it goes up to variables, that's fine. So now we can make use of variables in here. Uh, this will be the root, let that be default. We don't care about that. We're gonna set the root on each action in here. Um, delete those, call this download controller. And the root now, this is where we need the variable. So what we need in this root is basically this is telling it, you know, what part of the website would hit this requested action. So what you would type typically is, you know, this, and you'd have to potentially copy and paste, or you'd maintain two copies of uh, one thing. So you'd have this in your static front end web development usually, and then you'd have this back end ASP.NET Core site where you're also having this URL. And then if you changed it in one place and it didn't change in the other, you, you become out of sync. So by, instead of doing that, we can now make use of DNA web and inject a variable in the, the standard way. So $2 and then the name of the variable. So we could do this one, say, uh, batch process will do first, that's easy. Uh, and we chuck the URL batch process in and save. If we now look in here, we get a download controller and you can see it's injected our actual URL. So now it will point to, when we look for the download file, it will point to one. So we'll call this appropriate, let's call it 
uh, download batch process. And instead of returning a view, we'll return a file. And again, here, this is the file name. So if you want IntelliSense, you could do it in here. You know, you can learn in Visual Studio and then just simply apply it to your DNA web um, page. Or you can even open up in, you know, in here. But basically, if you type in file, uh, you can see you get the IntelliSense. So what we want is the path to the file, the content type, but also uh, the file download name. Otherwise, it would be, this would be the name the, the final parts, so there'd be no extension. So we want to return a file and we want it to have the path to the file, like the real path, which is in here. So assets, and then there'll be a folder called file. Uh, so if I just go to download, put files in, go to source assets, paste them in. We'll have files, they should appear in here now. Uh, sometimes we have to regenerate when we've added files. Uh, oh, there we go, it's in the middle of doing it. So. Oh yeah, it's just a bit slow. Uh, so we now have files and we've got the files in here I want. So it's this zip file I want to present. Uh, so that would be assets uh, forward slash files forward slash batch process dot zip, like so. Uh, then the type would be application forward slash x dash zip dash compressed, I believe. And then the name would be whatever you want the download name to appear. So we'd call it batch process.zip. Uh, and that's what we'd want here. So if we were to remember, you're not meant to edit this file, a generated one, or just showing you in there. Go back to the, the DNA CS file, and we pasted that in now. You can see there's our file. So we could extract this to a variable uh, and use it in the variables. Um, but I don't make use of this anywhere else. It's only ever used here, so I can leave that in as a, you know, this can just be static because we don't actually use it anywhere else. But I guess good practice would be, you would move this to a DNA variable and then this would become, you know, the variable name in here. And that's how you do it. But I'm not making use of that, you know, these links anywhere else. So for now, it's fine being there. Um, so that will allow us to download the file. So if I copy and pasted that three times, uh, did the other two links, batch process guide, and uh, what's the other one? Solid works files, I believe. Um, then these change to batch process .pdf, I think the file was. Yep, and then solidworks files .zip. Uh, the one thing we need to change on these is the name at the end. So that'd be batch process .pdf, uh, solidworks files .zip. And this would be application PDF for a PDF file. Uh, these would be new names, download batch process guide, download SOLIDWORKS files. If we were to save that now, uh, then run the reload that, yes, and run the website. Now if we point to forward slash download forward slash batch process, it should serve the file itself, hopefully. So there's the site, forward slash download, forward slash batch process. And there you go, you can see it's now served the batch process zip file. Uh, we can try the batch process guide, was it? Uh, batch process dash guide. Like that. And it serves a PDF. So then if we go to the SOLIDWORKS page now, our links that we have in here, uh, like this one, you click and it, it now works. So it's a a functional working site. So you can go through the whole site and this is what I'd do and double check that any download links um, actually work. So there's a download link and you can see that opens up and gives us a file. Uh, getting started guide, it gives us a file. So that's all working. So that's how I've generated a file server, if you will. So this is now a nice looking link, download batch process. Um, and it'll actually point to the real file in assets, which is there. So this site's now fully complete. This is ready for publishing. So that's what we're gonna do next. So that's the site done. We can happily close that off, save that. Um, that's just saving a solution file, that's fine. Uh, close that off. Close that off, I think, for now. I think we're done with that. I think we're done with DNA Web. Let's just clean things up. Um, close that. Right, so we're now done. We've got the generated output. And we now want to publish this site. 
So the first thing we need to do is to generate that website now in a publishable format ready for actually distributing to a server. So in your server root, type in CMD to open up a um, command line. And then in here, you type in .NET publish, the runtime dash R is, it's gonna run, in my case, on a Windows 64 server. So I'm win dash x64. Could be x86, I believe, or x32, I can never remember which. Uh, you can have Linux, um, Linux ARM, you can have uh, Linux x64, I believe. All these are the .NET Core published runtimes. So you can look for those runtime IDs. We're gonna run on a Windows 64 machine, so it's Windows x64. Configuration, so instead of it being in debug mode, you want it to be in release mode. And then dash dash output, and we'll just call the, we'll call the folder published. And press enter, and you'll see this will generate a published folder here in a minute. And there's the published folder, that's now done. So what we have in this published folder, all this stuff here, um, like all this and this and this and all these APIs, all the DLLs, that's effectively the .NET Core framework. So this is all self-contained and, and runnable without anything. This is effectively a package, like a portable package, if you will. You could put this on a normal Windows 10 machine with nothing installed, um, or even a Windows 8 machine or you know whatever. Um, and in order to now run your website, you just go to the name of the website, which is server root, and it's made an exe. So if we double click that exe now, it'll spin up um, a command line and it'll tell you now listening on localhost colon 5000. Uh, so if we browse to that now, and we type in localhost 5000, you should see this will load our page, just like we've had before and everything's in here. So we have the whole website. Uh, the download should still work. So we have all the download links, everything works. So this is now running and effectively the last step, it seems fairly small, there's quite a lot of steps involved, but the last step in essence is to simply put this on another machine, a server running in the cloud and have it run this EXE um, and then expose that port through the internet to your domain name. Um, but we'll do that whole setup uh, and show you how it goes. So the first step to doing that really is to now buy a domain name. So I've signed into my uh, domain provider, FX Domains, and uh, you, you buy a domain. So just search for, you know, buying a domain, it's nice and easy, and then purchase one. And then you'll get some management area where you can manage your domains. And then here, I'm managing Angel6. And then in this specific website, there's a, you're looking for this option, manage DNS, basically. Uh, so you manage the DNS of your newly created website. Uh, and you'll have a bunch of records. And these interfaces are a little bit different, but in essence, you're looking for A names, C names, uh, a bunch of stuff like this. If you've just bought your domain, um, I just personally delete all the records so there's nothing in. Uh, and then I make a new record, uh, and it's down here on um, FX Domains. You click Add, and then you select the type, and you want an A record. The host is star. And you want it to point to the IP address of your your server, the place where you're going to host your website from. So you could host it from your own machine if you want. And if you wanted to do that, just go to Google, type in what's my IP, um, and it'll give you the IP to your, your router, your local network, and you can put that in here if you want. Um, once you've got that pointing to the domain, your server's IP address, which we'll go through in a minute when we set it up a server, uh, you click Add. Then you'd add another one A name, and instead of star this time, you'd add at, and you'd point it to the same IP. And then what you'll end up with is two records like this that point to the domain, the sorry, the server. So now when you go to angel6.com, uh, it will resolve. So if we went to a command line, and to test that, uh, and we typed in ping angel6.com, you can see we have the matching IP address. So now all that's happened here is you've brought the domain name, and when they type angel6.com, it resolves and looks for a website. When you type it into the browser, of course, it looks for a website on port 80 or 443 uh, that's on this IP address. So that's step one done. That's kind of your domain name setup. Uh, so if I log out of that now, uh, and I'll log into um, where I'm going to host mine or where I do host mine is AWS from Amazon. So there's multiple places you can host, and all you really need is somewhere where you can get a... Windows server that you can access, you can remote into and set up and play with IIS and stuff. So the one I'm gonna use is AWS. 
So if you go to aws.amazon.com, then in the top, you can either create an AWS account or you can go my account, which I've got one, and then AWS Management Console. So create an account if you don't have one and then go to the console and then sign in. And then once you're signed in, you'll, you'll come to a page looking similar to this. Uh, you click services, EC2 is what we want. So we'll go to EC2. Then we'll go to instances and this is server instances. And you can see I've got my um, server already running and that's the IP address that I've, I've got. So that's what now points to this server. Uh, but if you want to make one, you click launch instance and then you'll be presented with this page of multiple options. Uh, then you can select server 2016 base, uh, server with containers, server now, there's so many options. Um, so you can pick one with, if you need SQL server, then you can go with, you know, one with SQL server. It all depends on what you want. It's basically a machine hosted in the, um, the cloud, if you will, for you. Um, all of these, I believe, come with IIS uh, as a standard because the Windows server. So you can really pick any option you want. Uh, they all come at a certain cost and you can simply Google for, you know, if you're not using this provider, maybe you're using um, Azure or somebody else. Uh, they'll all have a pricing tier and it's based on how much the usage is. So how many times people visit your site and how much, you know, CPU usage there is. Um, a safe bet I go with typically is probably Windows Server 2016 with SQL Server Web. So you click select, say. Uh, and then you've got these options again, more options, and it's all based on power and there's descriptions, how many cores you've got, how much memory the machine's got, um, whether it's optimized, uh, whether it's good for network performance, which you really want. Um, so you can scroll down. Again, I typically go with a moderate M.4 large. So you click that, click next, or review and launch, to be honest, from there. Review and launch then, uh, you can simply click launch at this point, uh, and that'll spin up your... Uh, your server. Uh, once you've done that, you end up with this server here. Like, you know, you'll end up with a server on here that says running. Um, and you'll also end up with the key thing you've got to do is one, now you'll take the IP address and you'll put it into the um, the the domain management, the DNS, what we did a minute ago. Uh, I'd recommend to first click Elastic IPs and allocate, you know, make a new address basically. So you just allocate a new address, you'd buy one. Um, I think it's a couple of dollars a month or something. And then you'd assign it to, you click actions and allocate address, and then you'd find this instance. A stat, uh, an elastic IP is basically a static IP. So that means once you set this, this won't change. Otherwise, by default, this could change. It's unlikely, but it could, but then your site would go down and you'd have to do like a no IP um, dynamic update client or something to fix that issue. But to keep it simple, I'd make sure your IP is static. You know, so whatever service you're using, if it's AWS, then just make an elastic IP. Set your IP address and your domain name. So now this points to this server. Uh, the other important thing is, uh, now we have this, you'll see down here, the instance when you click on it, you have security group and you've got inbound rules. Um, so if we click inbound rules, um, or even better, we can go to security groups down here, click the, group that we've created and look at inbound at the bottom. So you can see these are all the firewall rules in terms of not the firewall on the Windows server itself, but the firewalls because we're in this kind of setup, this cloud setup, um, this network security group handles what's allowed into your server. Um, so you, the rules you want to add uh, are minimum. You want the port 80 open um, so that you can access the website. So you click edit on the inbound rules, you click add rule, and then in the drop down, you've got some obvious ones. You've got HTTP, you click add, it adds port 80 and allows everybody through. We've already got that up there though, um, so that doesn't matter. Uh, you then add port 443, if, which is here, which is HTTPS, but I don't think there's a rule for HTTPS. Oh yeah, there is HTTPS there, you click and it open 443. So that allows you to have um, the website exposed on 443 as well. And then it all depends on what other services you're using. Um, so I'm using other things, obviously. So that's why there's other things in here. Uh, but in essence, you need to make sure you've got open port 80 and port 443 uh, so that you can actually, um, you know, expose websites from this server. And you'll also notice we have port 3389 open. Uh, and this is something you should do. As soon as you've set up your server now, 
what you should not allow is this is remote desktop. So I can now go and type remote desktop connection um, and then spin up this and type angel6.com. And right now you could do this. You won't by the video by the time the video is launched, you can't, but this is how it'd spin up by default. You can now click enter and anybody can try and remote into my uh, machine, if you will, my AWS server, and then just keep guessing passwords and trying to you know hack into the account, if you will. So what you should do instead, um, if you've already added RDP, if not, uh, then you want to add it because uh, you need to get into the machine. So you'd have to add uh, RDP and then it'd set this all up, uh, which is what you want to do. But instead of having um, the RDP on a set, you know, allow everywhere, if you will, uh, you want it on a specific IP. So what you can do in here is change it from custom to my IP. Um, and then that'll just be the same thing. So you can delete the second one. Um, so then this is now going to block it to specifically my IP only. So nobody else can remote in. So only this machine and this network I'm on can now try and remote into my server. And that's a, a protection you will need because people will try and get into your site. Um, so that's mainly for the RDP. You don't do it for the, obviously the website. Otherwise, you know, nobody can access your website other than you. Um, so that's opening the ports. That's all that done. Uh, and now what you can do is, as I mentioned, you can actually um, connect to this server. So if you, it depends on your setup again, but AWS tends to use public and private keys that you would have been requested during the creation of your server. It would have asked you to um, generate a new public and private key pair, and that's how you log in. So I won't do that on screen because of obviously the security issue, but it's part of the simple setup process. Then you click connect, uh, and then it would tell you uh, you can either download remote file or instead you can just go into the start menu, type remote desktop connection, and it opens up this remote desktop connection for you. Um, and then if you say got your private key on this machine, you click get password, upload the private key and it'll generate your password. Um, and then the default username is administrator on these. So you click connect to angel6.com or you know your website. If it's not set up as administrator, you click more choices use a different account and now you type in administrator uh, if you spell it right uh, and then you put in your long secure password uh, and at that point you'll remote into the machine so with this done i'll just log out of this and i'll have to obviously blur all the uh, private info on all these pages but hopefully that's enough knowledge that you can do this and repeat this yourself as i mentioned there's so many ways of where you can buy a domain uh, where you can host a server so I can't really cover every known avenue, but the basic principle is you need a Windows machine that you can remote desktop into um, so you can connect to IIS and set up stuff. Um, and then you want the IP to that machine to be public and static. And then when you buy the domain, you want the two A records, one that's as star and the other that's at, and that both point to this IP address. So now naturally when you try and resolve that IP or that domain angel6.com, it will point to the server and then the server has the inbound rules set up to allow RDP and port 80 and port 443 for the website. So that's all that done. So I'll just log out of that. And now we can remote desktop into this machine. So now we're remoted into angel6.com, my actual server, if you will. Uh, so again, if you've set up this with AWS, you should pretty much see this exact thing. Um, then you should have by default, IIS installed. So you can open the start menu and type IIS and hopefully you've got IIS installed. If not, just install it, just Google how to install IIS. But if you've installed Windows Server, Man uh, sorry, Windows Server, you should almost definitely have IIS. Uh, so that'll give you basically a server with nothing in. You'll have no, um, no websites or anything yet, which is fine. Uh, first step, open up your internet on that machine. Go to microsoft.com forward slash net forward slash download forward slash all. Um, go to the latest runtime that isn't a preview. So right now it's 2.0.5. Scroll down to Windows. And I'm on a Windows 64-bit machine, which I'm pretty sure everybody will be. So you want to install the 64-bit ASP.NET Core runtime installer. So click to download that. Uh, save that runtime package and install. Uh, and then also, just as importantly, make sure you download the server hosting installer. And this is what allows IIS to host ASP.NET Core websites. So install both of those. Once you've installed those, right-click on your server in IIS, uh, click Stop, 
and then once it's stopped, right click and click start. Uh, and that will basically allow the server hosting to integrate into IIS properly. The next is to also make sure this machine itself, if we go to the firewall, um, you go to the Windows firewall, and again, I won't for security reasons, but go to inbound rules, and then click add rule, and then allow ports, TCP, UDP, and allow port 80 and 443 to be inbound. So that allows websites to you know come into your machine. And now we just need to create a place to host the website. So for now, I'll give an example on the desktop here and just say websites. Um, and this folder now is where we will open up and then we'll take this, we'll copy our published folder here, the exact published folder, copy this, paste it into the um, Windows server. So this is now gonna copy over. Uh, so I'll just pause the video while this copies over uh, and then resume just before it finishes. Okay, while we're waiting for this to finish copying over, um, let yours copy over, but I'm gonna make the presumption that uh, this is done and I can kind of show you what to start doing in uh, the web server, in the IIS manager. So presuming that's all done and that's over, in your uh, IIS manager, right click on sites and click add website. And site name now, I'm gonna call this angel6, but I'm not gonna release it directly to the current angel6 site. So I'm gonna call it angel6.dev. The physical path now, you browse and you'll point to the actual website um, and the published folder, whatever you want to call it. That's the one we just copied over that's still copying, but that's the one. You point it to that. Uh, you want HTTP bound. Uh, you leave all that fine. If you were to um, leave this blank, it will always default to any website, no matter what uh, your domain is. So whether your domain's Angel6 or um, rusty.com or anything, it doesn't really matter. Wherever it points to, this would happily serve. If you want this to only ever reply, if the domain it's coming from is your actual domain name, then you type in here, which is what I recommend. So we typically, if this was my main site, I'd type angel6.com and I'd add this, then we'll add another binding afterwards uh, to also then be www. which is what a lot of people miss off. And that's why sometimes websites don't work with or without the www dot in front. Um, so we'll do, because this though is not gonna be just angel6.com, we want it to be a, a development site, uh, we'll do a few things. One is we'll first log back into our domain provider. So let me just do that now. And we're back in the management domain of angel6.com. Now, because I want to type in dev.angel6.com, I want to add a C name. You can see I've got C names here for other things. Um, so I've got one already added, C name, dev, uh, dev, and then it's pointing to a. So all you do for that is click add, change the type from a to C name. Um, the host would be uh, the short, you know, the thing before dot angel, uh, yeah, angel6.com. So this would be dev.angel6.com. And points to, you can just do at, and that basically refers to the IP address that we've already got set up with the name at. So it basically points to the same thing. It does nothing but now, angel6.com and devangel6.com will both point to that server. So you want to see name, the prefix, and then, you know, that bit there. Uh, so that's that bit done. So now we'll just go back to the server. And in here, we'll type dev.angel6.com. And that's the only one we need. We don't need dev and www, because obviously it's not. Uh, the one time you do need both is like say when it's your actual main domain. So if you want angel6.com to point to this website, you'd have to add the angel6.com and then you'd also have to add the www.angel6.com afterwards. Uh, but because we're going to dev specifically this exact URL, dev.angel6.com, we just add it once. Uh, start website immediately. Uh, and then we click okay, it's bound to port 80, so HTTP at the minute. Um, so we just want to let this finish now, uh, which has got about a minute left it reckons. Um, so as soon as this bit's finished, uh, we'll we'll click start, and then this site should effectively um, it should work straight away. Uh, and then obviously, if we were going to do HTTPS, which we're not right now, um, then we just bind. We'd add another binding and click HTTPS. Same setup, just change that to HTTPS and bind to that as well. And then obviously, you'd have to install your uh, SSL certificate, which uh, is really you know beyond this video. Simply publish into a server for now. Uh, but we will do that in future uh, with the Facetta Word 
server. So 60 seconds left. Um, one thing we'll have to do as well, because we are pointing this, um, this website to this folder, either this folder itself, the actual, uh, I shouldn't have double clicked that, that won't open until it's done. Uh, either this folder itself or the published folder or the website's folder, the host folder if you will, we need to add security to it so that IIS, the IIS user, the thing that's hosting this website can actually uh, access the website. But I'm not going to do that uh, yet because I want to show you the error you'll get that you might get if you forget this step and then you'd know uh, you know that that makes sense that the reason it's got that issue is because you forgot to do a certain step um, So this should be done 10 seconds any second now Last bit of JavaScript and this took a while because I was copying a hundred and sixty meg installer file as well as the website So that's why it's taking a little while So that's now apparently done f5 to refresh. We see nothing there we go. So we've got the published folder, we've got the website. Uh, first thing you can do is on the machine before we put it into IS is to make sure you installed those server hosting and the ASP, um, ASP.NET runtimes is double click the exe on this machine and it should successfully run. Um, and then you can also check your website's copied over correctly by then going to the, you know, the website on this server and actually trying to access that website just to make sure that the copies worked, that everything's moved over, uh, that effectively the site is good before we move it to IIS because if you get an issue, you want to know if it's either IIS or the website. So this stage is important to check your published copied files over, make sure that they're working. There's the website up and running. So that's cool. So we're happy that the, the published folder is a valid ASP.NET Core website. Um, so we'll leave that for now. We'll come back to the security in a minute. We've set this all up. We click OK. Now it's created angel6.dev. If we go to application pool, you can see it's made angel6.dev. Uh, what you do want to change though is if you double click, the runtime is not managed because it's .NET Core. So click this runtime, change it to no managed code. Click OK. Uh, and then there's now your website. So is the angel6.dev. We click bindings and you'll see the one we just made. So this is where you'd then add your additional. If you wanted to add HTTPS, you'd do it here. If you wanted to add the www dot, if it was the host one, uh, like this, you'd add it now. Um, or if you added the one without, you'd add, you know, the one with whichever way around, you'd add your multiple bindings. Um, then you can now click browse and you can click this browse button and it will actually browse to uh, the, the dev.angel6.com, which should now be this site. We should get an error though of I think 500, there you go. So this is working because uh, this is, um, this points to this server's IP address, angel6.com, so dev's pointing to it. The reason you get this 500 error though, there's many reasons you get it, but the reason we've got it here from a fresh install and a fresh build is that IIS and specifically the application pool identity uh, this user that's trying to, you know, that is running this website doesn't have permission to access this folder. So either right click on the published or what I recommend itself is right click on your top level websites that IIS will host. Go to security, um, go to edit, add, and then in here type IIS underscore IUSRS and press OK. And that's the user. That user is basically this application pool identity. Uh, and then allow it to have full control of the website's folder because that's what this you know identity should be doing uh, and click OK. And now you don't always have to restart the website. So if we simply went to the website and clicked here, it should now hopefully spin up. It's taking its time, which is good, which means it's likely spinning up the website itself. And there's the site. So this is now dev.angel6.com. So if we try this on our actual machine, you know, like come out of the server and go onto a normal computer now and type dev.angel6.com, you can see there we go. We now have a live site. This is now my site live and ready to go. Um, so I can go to SolidWorks. Let's make sure the downloads work. Uh, there we go. Yep, and there's the files. So it looks like now the website is fully uh, functional. 
So that's the whole, real, the whole setup of um, how you do this. And then say we now wanted to, I was happy with this website uh, and I want it to go live. I can go to my main website, Angel6, um, and then you click the um, basic settings and then you just simply change the physical path to point to this folder. And that would redirect the website to this folder, which is what I'll do after this video. So the website does go live. Um, but that's that's in essence uh, how you take a static HTML page right the way through to owning a domain name, having a server running and hosting the whole website. So this is now a fully published and, and running website. Uh, as I mentioned, though, there are a lot of uh, variations in this whole process. There's so many ways you can host it. There's so many people you can use. There's there's firewalls. There's you know there's all kinds of situations. I'll help everyone as much as possible if they use alternate, you know, things. If they don't use AWS or, um, they, you know, they want to do it a different way, I can certainly try and help. But hopefully this video has been detailed enough to follow through, you know, the set procedure of taking static pages to an ASP.NET Core website, then publishing to a folder that's then a runnable website, with then the intention to basically host that published folder on a server, uh, linking it in with the domain name, and then ultimately chucking it in IIS. Uh, so this is, like I say, we've, we've done a lot in one video there, and there's a lot of variations, so there's likely going to be a lot of questions, but hopefully it was useful. Um, again, if you like what I'm doing, I do have a Patreon page, uh, patreon.com forward slash angel6. Um, you know, so if you want to support what I'm doing, it'd be greatly appreciated. Uh, and as usual, any comments or questions, simply leave them in the video, and I'll get back to you, but hopefully this was a useful video.